Evan Osmos, good to see you again. You too. Nice to see you. Yeah, um, it feels like the last time I saw you, I was uh, 30-something years old, and now I am 52, but I only aged in one night. How are you doing? I'm 112, actually, but uh, holding up okay. Thank you. Holding up really well. Welcome to the Daily Social Distancing Show. Thanks for having me. You are a Pulitzer Prize-winning author. You are a journalist. You are somebody who has spent a lot of time living the life of Joe Biden through the lens of your work. As this moment unfolds, how do you think Joe Biden is situated to help the country recover from what is going to be arguably one of the most tumultuous elections in history? Well, in a strange way, he's had a, a, a lot of practice of a certain kind for this, and it's terrible practice. I mean, if we know anything about Joe Biden, we know that he has been through some really wretched things in his life. After all, we know his, remember his late wife, Nelia Hunter, his daughter, Naomi, they died in a car accident when he was just 29. Mm -hmm. And then later, his son, Bo, died of a brain tumor. And I mention that partly because I think in politics, sometimes we're sort of a little cynical about things like that. We think that it's kind of being used as a prop. And what I find fascinating from looking into his life is seeing the way that it really altered him. It changed him. I mean, just being acquainted with suffering in quite that way, in that right. very real right. personal way, resonates with the condition we're in as a country. We are literally suffering. We're literally grieving. And so he knows something of that. If Joe Biden is to win the election, he's going to be in an interesting position where it looks like Republicans will still have the Senate, Democrats will have the House. And so now, in many ways, his selling point is going to be tested. Can Joe Biden be the person who brings the sides together to get things done for America. Even though no president, incoming president, if that's what he is, would ever ask to preside over a country as divided as he is, the truth is he actually has some experience in these moments. To give you one example, when they came in in 2009, one of the first things he did was he started lobbying the late Senator Arlen Specter of Pennsylvania to change parties, go from being a Republican to a Democrat. He was also given an assignment. The Obama administration said, all right, Joe Biden, we want you to call up members of the Senate, try to get them to vote for the stimulus bill. So we did that. He started working the phones. He's kind of constantly on the phones with people on Capitol Hill. And he got people, he got three votes. And those turned out to be the three votes that ended up being decisive in passing that bill. So in a way, if he was a boxer, you would say that he's kind of comfortable in the clutch, like right up close. That's, that's, his, uh, that's his happy place, as strange as it may sound. Once, once Obama took office and once the Tea Party took its hold of the Republican Party and then Trumpism by extension, there's no denying that politics has changed dramatically. Do you think he'll still have the same pull and sway with the Republicans to get them to do it? Or do you think that he's now just going to be facing, if he wins again, four years of just being blocked by Mitch McConnell and, and the Senate crew? I think, look, we'd be insane not to worry about that. That's the reality. That's the lay of the land. That's certainly the politics we inhabit right now. I think there's something interesting that we sometimes lose sight of, which is that it matters the posture with which a president sells the policy. Meaning, if they're selling it from the middle, strangely enough, you can actually sometimes sell things that you can't sell if you're coming at it from a distinctly uh, progressive direction or a hardline conservative direction. I mean, in fact, some progressive analysts have done some survey work. And what they find is that people in America might go for more aggressive climate change legislation if it's being presented to them as job growth or right, a way of building right. a sustainable economy rather than, look, this is a moral obligation to future generations. You've written extensively about Biden. You've also written extensively about China. Um, this is going to be one of the biggest challenges that America faces going forward. Where do you think Biden begins? Because he's had, he's had some tough rhetoric on China. But you can't deny that America needs the relationship with China, or it's been set up in such a way that they need it. So, like, what, is, what does he do, and wh how do you see that relationship unfolding? Well, for one thing, I think, frankly, China is going to be a little sorry to see Donald Trump go, because even though Donald Trump sort of uses a lot of language of confrontation, he has sort of efficiently undermined American credibility in the eyes of the world. There was a recent study that showed that Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin now have higher favorabilities than Donald Trump. So wow. from China's perspective... Joe Biden's actually a little bit more of a problem. He's kind of like a recognizable form of president and diplomat. So I think what you're likely to see is that Biden will probably actually hold on to some of this confrontational stuff that the Biden that the Trump administration has done because it makes it easier. It gives him leverage. But what he'll do that's completely different is he'll do it with allies. He'll do it in the concert of American allies in Europe and in Asia rather than America first, which often meant that we were doing things alone. Do you think Biden will be able to sell himself as that guy? Because 
I mean, one of the big differences between Trump and really any U.S. president has been that Trump knows how to sell his achievements, whether they exist or not. Joe Biden seems to be the kind of person who says, well, read my record, check what I did. And people are like, we don't read, Joe. <laughs> we don't read. That's not the world we live in. Yeah. So do you think that he will be able to rebuild some of the bridges that have been broken down in many of these industrial areas that he used to have such a strong base in? Well, I, I mean, it is true that he is kind of like stubbornly attached to the reality-based universe. He seems to think that like is consequential and that he has to respond to that. We know there are millions of Americans who just voted for Donald Trump. It wasn't a fluke this time. They knew what they were doing. And what he's going to do, I think his basic strategy, as he said to me and he has said to others, is if you begin from the principle that I am listening, I'm listening to you in a real way, you'd be surprised what the effect might have on our political chemistry. Look, that's an optimistic take. But he doesn't have any option. It's better than going in there and saying, I'm giving up on half of you because you didn't vote for me. When you look at the journey that America faces, the next American president would face if it would be Joe Biden, would you say that his personal loss and the tragedies that he's faced put him in a position to be the best leader to lead America out of one of its greatest tragedies, which has been the pandemic? I do. I think in a curious way, this life of ups and downs that he's had of failures in some cases of embarrassment and then of great successes has primed him to fit into where we are as a country. Because let's be frank, we've had our ups and downs lately. <laughs> and if we are now talking more candidly also about our whole history and the ways in which we have not treated people the way we should. And I think he's at a moment now where we are coming to terms with a little bit more of a humbler notion of what it means to be Americans, both at home and in the world. And he's a bit of a humbler person than he was when he got into the Senate uh, some, you know, 150 years ago. So I, I think he really is coming at this from the position of recognizing our strengths and our limitations. And that's better, probably, than coming at it with an imagined idea of what we are and that we're going to make ourselves something we never really were. Evan, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for joining us today, and uh, hopefully I'll see you again soon. My pleasure. Thanks, Trevor.